Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I'll be your host. I am a keen lover of train travel. Our American Amtrak map moves around the U.S. of A, albeit a tad on the slow side. In my younger years growing up with my main family, I relished the journey across the long expanse of Canada on the transcontinental passenger train. I thought then it was just spectacular, which I'm sure it still is. During my several years of living in Paris and then London, I often wended my way through the channel to the White Cliffs of Dover and across the country in all directions from bottom to top and well into Scotland. In reverse, southeast under the same waters of the English Channel, there were so many directions to explore through France and all of the neighboring countries. It was amazingly easy. And then, of course, there is the historic and grand Orient Express, famous for elegance beyond first class service, and of course, made iconic by Agatha Christie and her famous murder on the Orient Express. Oh, imagine Paris to Constantinople. Via Lausanne, Milan, Triest, Venice, Belgrade, and Sofia. Mm. Routes and destinations have now been altered and added. Aging tracks have slowed down the pace at meal times and during the night. And tuxedos and glittering gowns for dinner are no longer required for the evening dining event. Still, the carriages remain grand and the service is kingly. But the greatest train adventure of my life was the 3,000 mile journey in days of less tumult from Cairo, Egypt, across Libya, Little Tunisia, Big Algeria, ending in Casablanca, Morocco. I must admit, the journey involved many more train changes, far more passport checks, a certain number of surly looks from officious conductors, and I must admit, a few scary moments being a stranger in a strange land. One of my more intriguing, intriguing encounters during a side excursion into the Libyan desert, the far western end of the Sahara, on a two-day train delay, for technical reasons, the situation was the happenstance crossing of paths with a group of Bedouin desert dwellers. Although originating in Syria, Bedouin territory now stretches from the vast 3.5 million square mile Sahara Desert of North Africa to the rocky sands of the Middle East. The Bedouin are a traditionally divided group into tribes or clans, and historically share a common culture of herding camels and goats. The vast majority of the current estimate of 25 million Bedouins, 25 million, adhere to Islam, although there are some fewer numbers of Christian Bedouins present in the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is the crescent-shaped region 
in the Middle East, spanning modern day Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan, together with the northern region of Kuwait, the southeastern region of Turkey, and the western portion of Iran, a very large area. The Bedouins I met in the Sahara Desert of Libya live a life on the go, mostly, frequently in trading caravans that are alien and unfathomable to even the most adventurous and curious of Western explorers like me. The Bedouin ethos comprises courage, hospitality, loyalty to family, and pride of ancestry. Bedouin tribes are not controlled by central power like a government or empire, but rather led by tribal chiefs. A widely quoted Bedouin saying is, quote, I am against my brother, my brother and I are against my cousin, my cousin and I are against the stranger. <laughs> the saying signifies a hierarchy of loyalties based on the proximity of some person to oneself, beginning with the self and proceeding through the nuclear family. The independence of the nomadic lifestyle in the heat of, des of the desert, combined with the strong sense of self and survival under the harshest of conditions, is what struck me as most fascinating in my short time being welcomed ceremoniously and treated in every way as a long lost brother. It was a moving and intensely memorable moment in my journey across the top of the African continent. And it is this experience that leads to today's author and book in the spotlight. In my search for a book of travel exploration for today's program, I crossed the path of Ibrahim Al Konai, a Libyan writer considered to be one of the most prolific Arab novelists of our time. Mythological elements, spiritual quest, and existential questions mingle in the writings of Al Konai, who has been hailed as a magical realist a Sufi fabulous and a poetic novelist. Incredible labels, hey? The title of today's book is The Bleeding of the Stone, published in Arabic in 1990 and in English in 2002 by May Jayuzi and Christopher Tingling. Through the experiences of a single Bedouin man, the novel portrays a combination of ecological issues, traditional desert life, and the power of the human spirit. It also addresses the idea of the constant struggle between good and evil. But, before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Ibrahim al Konai began his Saharan life journey in 1948 as a member of the Toreg people in the Nat, G-N-A-T, district of southwest Libya at the border with Algeria which is 800 miles to the southwest of the country's Mediterranean capital of Tripoli. The Tuareg 
are a large Berber ethnic group that principally inhabits the Sahara in a vast area stretching from far southwestern Libya to southern Algeria. The Tuareg are a semi-nomadic people who practice Islam and are descended from the indigenous Berber Bedouin communities of Northern Africa. The Tuareg are most popularly known as the Veiled Men or the Blue Men. Perhaps you've seen that in a National Geographic. This is an allusion to the tagelmust garment that is traditionally worn by Toreg men, including a litham, a mouth veil traditionally used to cover the lower part of the face. Remember, we are on camels going through the desert. English speaking outsiders often refer to the veiled men as the blue men similarly derived from the indigo color of the tagelmast, the whole facial covering, veils, their veils and other clothing, which sometimes stains the skin underneath, giving it a bluish tint. Thus, the blue men. The Tarek have controlled several trans-Siberian trade routes and have been an important party to the conflicts in the Saharan region during the colonial and post-colonial times. Of growing up in the desert, Al Konai shares these interesting words. As the birthplace of creation, the desert is the source of the existential questions I pose in all my writings. The reason the desert the place I come from, is alien to us, can be traced to modern people's tendency to see it as an empty void. However, the spiritual wealth of the desert is immeasurably greater than its material wealth. Indeed, it is the sanctuary from which waters of the timeless deluge receded at the dawn of creation causing the depths to witness the birth of dry land, inaugurating the era of our existence on this planet. Proud man of his world in the desert, al Kanai did not learn to read or write Arabic until he was 12 years old. He then made a great leap and studied comparative literature at the Gorky Institute in Moscow, and was a journalist in Russia and in Warsaw, Poland. He is the author of 80 books, all inspired by the desert, including novels, short stories, and poems. His works have been translated into more than 35 languages. Ibrahim al Konar was the winner of the Mohammed Zefzaf Prize for the Arabic novel in 2005 and the 2008 Sheikh Zayed Award for Literature. He was recognized in 2009 on the long list for the International Prize for Arabic Fiction. He was also a finalist for the Man Booker International Prize in 2015. Ibrahim Alponai has lived in Switzerland since 1993, far from his spiritual home on the far western edge of the vast Saharan desert in the southwest of Libya. And surely his visual memories and the vivid images in his mind's eye play significant roles in all of his books, especially, I think, in The Bleeding of the Stone. So, about the novel then. This spare novel of only 135 pages, rather a novella, it's prominent Libyan author's first 
to reach English translation is a winning combination of ecological fable, political statement, and lyrical lament for the past. The focal character is Asuf, A-S-O-U-M, Asuf, a weathered but still young Bedouin herdsman who lives essentially alone with his goats in a mountainous desert region, all but untouched by the modern age. He is tasked with watching over ancient caves and their cave door drawings. Asuf's peace is routinely disrupted by, quote, Christian tourists, who flock to observe ancient religious paintings hidden away on the walls of honeycombed caves. The Mouflon, a near mythical wild sheep prized for its meat, continues to survive in the remote mountain desert and only Asuf, who cherishes the desert and identifies with his creatures, knows exactly where it is to be found. Now he and the mouflon together come under threat from hunters who have already slaughtered the once numerous desert gazelles. More severely threatened by ebullient Westerners are those who enlist him to guide their hunt for the mouflon more often referred to in the book as the Wadan, W-A-D-G-A-N, same thing, two different words, believed to be a sacred animal. The story's melodramatic apocalyptic finale so effectively displays the power of Alconi's subtle dramatization of irreconcilable cultural misunderstanding and enmity. In my humble opinion, as I always like to share, I quote from one of Asuf's talks to himself. There was no life for a migrant stranger in alien lands, for the curse of heaven would find him wherever he went. The only talisman able to protect against beasts and evil ones in the desert is patience and cunning in calamity. These words of Asu echo throughout the focused and concise storytelling of Ibrahim Al Qunai. Survival of as an aging Bedouin hermit with only a few goats in the intense heat of the Saharan desert is simply impossible for me to fathom. I could hardly fathom 118 degrees in Phoenix where I used to live. When I wanted to understand this relationship with the near barren, seemingly unending land of sand, more than that, I was drawn to the man as animal mindset in the survival game. And even more fascinating, the man animal to animal connection. Roles played by Asu, obviously, as the man animal, and the equally determined, clever, cunning, and patient, almost mythical, Wadan, the wild goats. Exploring the thought process and the strategy of the Bedouin, the Wadan, and the enemy interloper to both was a rich learning experience in a brief 135 page journey in North Africa, as very much a stranger in a strange land. I am going to begin the reading today 
with a quotation from Sophocles, believe it or not. Each one of the chapters in the book begins with a quotation. It might be from Herodotus, the great histories of Herodotus, or something from the Quran. But this one I found interesting from Sophocles, Oedipus Rex. What places? He wanders the wild forest among the caves and crags like a mouflon exhausted with sorrows, seeking to flee what is ordained in the eternal tablet, but fate's dispensation flies forever above his head. No matter how cunning you can be, perhaps. Page. Let us begin then, if we may, at uh, the very first chapter of the book, uh, which is called The Stone Icon. Very short, actually. Many of the chapters in the book are very short. And then we'll continue on to something um, a bit more exciting about his father, Asuk's father. So we do begin with a quote from the Quran, uh, chapter 6, verse 38. There are no animals on land or birds flying on their wings, but are communities like your own. It was only when he started praying that the male goats decided to butt one another right there in front of him. Evening was coming. The flaming disk of the sun sinking slowly down from the depths of the sky as it bade farewell with the threat to return next morning and finish burning what it hadn't burned today. And Asuf plunged his arms into the sands of the wadi to begin his ablutions in readiness for his afternoon prayers. Hearing the roar of the engine, from afar, he decided to hurry and give God his due before the Christians arrived, so as to be ready as usual to welcome them to the wadi and show them the figures painted on the rocks, the cave. But Satan entered the goats, who took evident pleasure in butting at the very moment he said, God is great and began murmuring the Fatiha as if they were proud of their horns or wanted to show him their skill. They were restless today because a skittish she-goat had led on a headstrung male. He'd been following her since the morning, probing her with his nose, trying incessantly to climb upon her from behind, and this had aroused the jealousy of the other goats who gathered together and begun the contest using their horns as weapons. Cutting short his prayer, he cursed the devil, then went to pray in front of the most prominent rock in the wadi, Makhandush, Matkandush. This stood at the end of the wadi's western slope, where it met the wadi Inasis to form a single valley, deep and wide sweeping down northeast until it merged at last into the great Abroha in Masak Malad. The mighty rock marked the end of a series of caves standing there like a cornerstone. Through thousands of years it had faced the merciless sun, adorned with the most wondrous paintings ancient man had made anywhere in the Sahara. There was the giant priest depicted over the full height of the rock, hiding his face behind that mysterious mass. His hand touched the wadan that stood there alongside him, its air both dignified and stubborn, its head raised like the priests toward the far horizon where the sun rose to pour its rays each day on their faces. Through thousands of years, the mighty priest and the sacred wadan had kept those features clean and deep and clear, majestic and vivid, set in the heart of the solid rock. There the priest stood, taller and larger than man's natural figure, inclined a little toward the sacred wadon. 
that too surpass a normal wadon in size. When as a young man, Asuf had crossed the desolate wadi herding his goats, he'd never dreamed these paintings were so important. Today, they'd become a focus for Christian tourists who came from the most distant countries to see them. Crossing the desert in their special desert trucks to gaze at the stone, their mouths open in amazement before its enigmatic, enigmatic splendor and beauty. Once he'd even seen a European woman kneel in front of the rock, murmuring indistinct words, and he had known instinctively the words were Christian prayers. Similar paintings adored mountain rocks and caverns in the other wadis throughout the Masak Satfat area. He'd discovered them when, as a child, he'd tire himself out chasing after his unruly herd and go into the caves to find refuge from the sun seizing a few moments of rest and amusing himself by gazing at the colorful figures, at hunters with long, strange faces, pursuing a variety of animals, among which he recognized only the wadon and the gazelle and the wild ox. Painted on the rocks, too, were naked women with great breasts, huge indeed, out of all proportion to the size of their bodies. This had made him laugh as he thought of the breasts getting in the woman's way as they walked along. He'd lean back and shrieked with laughter, the echo ringing strangely through the unknown caves. Then as he climbed the mountains behind the goats, he discovered still further paintings. He saw painted on the rock walls hideous faces, like the faces of ghouls and of ugly animals not found in the desert. How was it his mother had never told him about these, even in her fairy tales? His father had never mentioned them either, before he died in dreadful pursuit of that charmed Wadon. They're the people who used to live in the caves, his mother told him, the first ancestors. But, he objected, you said Jin lived in the caves. She gazed at him, bemused, then smiled, rocking right and left as she shook the milk in her hands. Are our ancestors jinn spirits? He persisted. She stifled a laugh, but he saw in her eyes even so. He repeated his question, and at this time she just snapped, ask your father. And so he asked his father, who laughed outright. Perhaps they were from the jinn, he said, but from the good jinn. The jinn are like people. They're divided into two tribes, the tribe of good and the tribe of evil. We belong to the first tribe, to the jinn who choose good. Is that why we don't have any close neighbors? <laughs> yes, that's why. If you live near bad people, their evil will strike you. Anyone choosing the good has to flee from people to make sure no evil comes to them. That's what this group of jinn did. They lived in caves from time immemorial, away from evil. Can't you hear them talking together on moonlit nights? His mother broke in. Oh, why are you frightening him, she said, with all this stuff about the jinn talking at night. Why don't you go and milk the camel instead so I can have some milk before supper? Laughing again, his father went off. Asuf turned to his mother. I hear the chin in the caves every day, he said, talking to one another. They say the strangest things, and they even start singing sometimes. I'm not afraid of the chin. She laughed and threw some pieces of wood on the fire. Asuf still took pleasure in the jinn faces in the mountain caves. Fleeing the scorching heat, he'd take refuge, panting among the hollows of the rocks. There he'd lie for a time, then crawl to the rocky wall and start taking off the layers of dust until the lines painted in the rocks would begin to appear. Still he'd go on, wiping away at the mighty walls, until at last the faces would appear masked or long, or else animals fleeing from the arrows of the masked hunters. Wadon, 
gazelles, ox, and many others, huge in size, with long legs he never saw in the desert today. In time, he began calling the wadis, chasms, and mountains by the names of the figures painted on their rocks. This was the wadi of gazelles, that the path of the hunters, that the wadan mountain, that again the herdsman's plain, until finally he had discovered the great genie, the masked giant rising alongside his dignified wadan. His face turned toward the Gibla, awaiting sunrise and praising Almighty God in everlasting prayer. He was chasing the most unruly goats in the herd, who had strayed from the rest down the desolate Wadi Makanzdush. He caught up with them finally to for, uh, at the place where the Wadi merged with the nearby Ainesis to form one deep stately river valley winding its difficult way across the barren desert, veering toward the Abrahu plain. There were a cluster of caves stood, crowned in mighty rocks, and these were flanked by that one towering rock that stood like a building soaring toward the sky, like a pagan statue fashioned by the gods. The masked Jinni, with his sacred wadon, covered the colossal stone face from top to bottom. He stood long gazing at the tableau, then tried vainly to climb the rocks to touch the giant Ginny's mass. There were boulders strewn around the rock face. He tried to gain a hold on the smooth rocks, but some stones gave way under his feet and he fell on his back into the wadi. He struggled on for a while, writhing with pain then crawled on all fours to try and find some shade beneath a tall green palm tree standing in the middle of the wadi. His heart was beating violently, the sweat trickling from his body. When he reached the tree, the shade had vanished. This surprised him. But he stretched out under the tree even so, waiting for the cruelly beating sun to set. Next day, he found that the unruly goat who had wandered from the herd and led him to the cave of the master Jinni had been snatched by a wolf that same night. And he remembered how the palm tree had abandoned him, stealing its shade away when he'd taken refuge there after falling from the rock. So to give a few chapters to go to a very significant moment in the book for our man Asu. This is chapter five called The Price of Solitude. Yes, The Price of Solitude. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he didn't long enjoy the contentment of solitude in the desert, there in the desert with his father. The old man went off to hunt the Wadan in the mountains of Western Masis and was destined not to return. After they had waited some days for him, his mother gave voice to her fears. Your father wouldn't stay away without some reason. It's over a week since he left. Asuf took dates and water and set out after him. His father was unarmed now, which was why, instead of hunting the gazelles in Masak Malat, he'd had to go in pursuit of the charmed Wadan on the tops of the harsh, rugged mountains. Since that incident he had described to Asuf, he'd become wary of hunting the Wadan and would never venture to the majestic heights until he'd recited all the Kippuran Kiran verses he had memorized, repeated in Hausa, all the spells of the African magicians, then hung around his neck all the snakeskin amulets he had brought from soothsayers traveling in caravans from Kano. The day before he left, he'd sit murmuring his spells and keep strict silence otherwise, refusing to answer their questions. He'd sleep outside the tent, too, 
to avoid having to speak with either of them. Then leave at dawn on his camel, empty-handed. Yes, unarmed and empty-handed. For he'd run out of ammunition for his old rifle, and the merchant caravans traveled to Sudan or to Agades only rarely now. Months would go by without a caravan from the land of the black people passing through. He had lost his connections, too, with the people from the oases of the Wadi Ajal, or Gat, or Uenat, or Mazuk. Especially since news had spread that the Italians had invaded their shores with plans to penetrate south into the desert. They had raised the price of ammunition and made the use of weapons a forbidden hazardous business. Every Bedouin in the desert would rather hide a bullet in the pupil of his eye, ready to use it to defend his children at the dreadful moment the enemy launched its invasion of the desert. For if the Italians had come, they'd enter every tent. Isolated though the Bedouins were in their southern wilderness, news of the invaders still came to them on the winds, as rumors always do among desert tribes. Rumors of marriage and divorce and scandal, of death and the birth of new children. Nothing's ever secret in the desert, no matter what lonely spot you choose. Once, though, when his father was away, Asuf's mother had whispered to him of some bullets his father had hidden in the hunter's cave. He was, she said, careful how he used them. He'd laughed that day, remembering what his father had once said, quote, a man in the desert must be sparing with two things, water and bullets. In the desert, he had gone on, water and bullets were like air, the very foundation of life. If you ran out of the first, you'd die of thirst. And if you ran out of the second, some enemy, man or beast or snake, would strike you down. Water and bullets were the lifeblood of a lone man. He could go without anything else but not these. Asuf had no doubt his mother was right. His father had hidden those bullets in the cave against a day of misfortune, so he'd be able to affirm his strength and manhood. He'd shot a bullet in the enemy's face before he'd die himself. He wouldn't let them gloat as they dragged him along, trussed up like a lamb. It's no shame to die with your hands around a rifle. The shame is when you die bound like a lamb. The shame is to fall alive into the enemy's hands, to be a prisoner. No one falls prisoner except the coward or the man without a weapon. That was why his father had chosen to hide a few bullets in the hunter's cave and go off to hunt the Wadon unarmed. And that was why he died in such a fearful way. If he hadn't been so resolved not to be taken alive, hoarding his bullets against the day of misfortune, he would have been spared that hideous death. For some days, Asu followed his father's tracks, and when he found the traces of that struggle with the Wadon in the Wadi Anisis, fear gripped him. He followed the signs of the encounter along the Wadi until he found blood spots on some stones, then drops of blood widely scattered on the sand in the Wadi's heat. Was the wounded creature the Wadon, or was it his father? He had no way of knowing. The traces would appear, then disappear, would veer left toward the rugged slope with its covering of sharp black stones, then back to the sandy bed where palm trees and wild grasses grew here and there. Under a high palm tree, the battle had grown fiercer. Traces were thick and numerous, one on the other. Had the old man tried to tie the savage beast to the trunk of this tall palm before the wadon? 
at last prevailed and dragged him a few steps across the wadi? Or, though God, had he gripped the beast by the horns, done what he himself had so often warned his son never to do? Nothing, his father had said, drove the wad on to frenzy by gripping, the, gripping them on the horns. It didn't matter how strong you were, how stirred by the hope of victory. If you once tried that, then the battle was lost. The Wadon's madness lay in his horns. All his hidden savagery would wake, would boil over, and he'd launch his ferocious attack. The Wadon was trying to escape now. He'd veered off toward the mountain. The Wadi was getting deeper, the mountains higher. The Wadon was drawing him on toward that ugly, mysterious summit. Asuf's heart started to pound as he sent his gaze upward. There he sensed something had happened. Beneath the peak or on the very top or somewhere on the slopes, there were no traces of struggle visible now. He ran, panting, across the narrow wadi between the two mountains. Ominous shadows lay over the pass. He turned left, scrambled swiftly up the steep slope. Suddenly, a fetid smell seemed to assail his nostrils. His heart leaped. Nausea swept through him, and pain beat inside his head. The nearer his mad descent took him toward the summit, the higher and sharper the blacker the rocks became. He was clamoring on all fours now. The fetid smell grew stronger. Then just beneath the ill-omened summit, near a long rock stretching several spans across the slope, he found the old man. Lying on his back, his face toward the sky, and his eyes empty. The face was blue, and large blue flies hovered over him. There was no sign of bleeding, not a single spot of blood, except for some scratches on the arms, stretched out alongside his body. The possessed Wadan had caused him to break his neck just as he himself had once made that other Wadon do the same. And our remaining time, let's focus on Asuf's almost sad repeat of his father's demise, interestingly enough. This chapter nine is called The Pit. And we won't be able to get through it all, so I'll have to leave you in suspense a little bit. When the possessed beast broke his father's neck, Asuf remembered his mother's words about the vow. Then he promptly forgot it. Youth is the devil's companion. It tempted him, and he thought no more of the matter. One day the devil's devil smuggled three Wadon into his herd of goats, then sat watching him from the mountaintop. It happened a few years after his father's death. Asu was graving his herd in the south of the Wadi Matkandush, where the waters from rivers and floods had formed deep gullies. Before the Wadi veered to the right, then disappeared among the high western mountains, among sheer rocks that stood like phantoms guarding the stony desert and keeping watch over the palm trees in the depths. He lay down under a rock on the slopes, watching the stubborn goats as they tried to reach up to the green branches of the palms. Laughing, he saw how a greedy she-goat strove to reach the green tips of a tree that was simply too tall for her. Alongside this tree stood an upright stone with a narrow top. The goat scaled this in two leaps, and a moment later, from its comfortable seat, was stretching its neck to the very top of the wretched tree to destroy its green cap. Meanwhile, at the other end of the wadi, near the faded wild thickets, a fine-looking he-goat, crowned with a pair of great curved horns, was visibly flirting with a comely, silver-colored she-goat, while alongside another he-goat, ugly and disheveled, 
looked resentfully on. The she-goat was responding to the play of the fine male, twisting her neck, brushing his nose with her own in brief kisses, then plunging her head into the dried up bushes with a busy pretense of eating the plants. These apparent rejections excited the fine handsome he-goat who ventured to approach closer. He advances a step and plunges head down next to hers, pretending to eat too, then thrust his nose forward to snatch a kiss from her. Then back it go to view her, hesitant and tentative from behind. It gaze around the pasture, exchange a threatening look with the other he-goat, then once more nuzzle the skittish female until he had reached her back part and could snuffle her smell. Still, the other he-goat looked restlessly on. There was fear in the gaze along with wariness and surprise. Suddenly it dawned on Asu that the fine, splendid goat lover wasn't a goat at all. It was a wadan. He read the signs in the eyes of the other he-goat, the true aspirant. A huge wadan gray in color with silver hair shining through his thick coat, a long beard dangling from his chin, his head crowned with a pair of great curved horns. How had he failed to see that this goat, which had roused his admiration, whose moves and flirtations with the she-goat he'd been following so closely, wasn't a goat at all, but the mighty Wada. In the heart of the wadi and among the net in among the herd, he saw two more wadan roaming with the goats. His father had never told him, nor had his mother, that the wadan might feel comfortable among ordinary goats, choosing to graze serenely alongside them, and that the males of this shy, secretive animal might venture on flirtation with the she goats. A few weeks before his father's death, the two of them had gone together to Abraho to bring back wood on a team of camels. Don't think animals can't understand, his father has said. Just because they can't speak the way you do, they're cleverer than either of us. That was his response to Asuf's teasing when he saw the great tenderness his father was lavishing on his piebald camel. He had talked to the beast during day and night alike. At dawn, before he prayed the, prayer, the dawn prayer. At noon, before he started eating his lunch. At night, before he went to sleep. He'd fondled the hairs on the camel's body, stroked his long neck, and with the most tender care, wiped the foam from the big dangling lips. Then he'd hug the beast's head and say, Did you ever, in the whole desert, see a more beautiful camel? one that was more obedient, braver, and more patient? Did you ever see one that was more intelligent and sensible? God, how beautiful he is. Look at this piebald camel, his eyes, his teeth, his slender neck, his legs, everything's in proportion, everything's graceful. Even his belly isn't like other camels' bellies. It's slim and small and smooth. In fact, he doesn't really have a belly because he's a noble camel. A noble camel doesn't have a belly. He won't desert his beloved for the sake of his belly, like those other greedy beasts. This piebald's the beloved of all the she camels in the Sahara. Yesterday, I had a token of admiration and praise passed on by a roving herdsman. From the comely she camels at Tamangast. They had sent him a new halter decorated with different colors and embroidered with gold threads. All the she camels knew his worth and loved him because he's the noblest, most beautiful camel in all the Sahara. With that, he'd go and fetch the beast a handful of the barley he took care to bring along, especially on all his trips, and he'd freed him from his outstretched hands. It spoiled his camel quite outrageously, even letting him drink from his own scarce supply of water. 
In the desert, the store of water is the store of life. No rider dares be liberal with it, endlessly threatened as he is with thirst. Amid all this playful pampering, Asu's father would turn to him regularly with the same piece of advice. Always take the greatest care of your camel. If you don't love him, he won't love you. If you don't understand him, he won't understand you. And when he won't save, then he won't save you when the going gets rough. Animals are more faithful than people. He had told him that night how a faithful camel once managed to save his owner from en enemies who had attacked him on one of their raids. They had made a circle all around him, and he had almost fallen into their hands. It was the gallantry and courage of his camel that saved him. The camel broke through the enemy's siege, heedless of the stabs of spears and knives, then went on, the blood flowing, until he had brought his owner to safety. Then he knelt down, stretched out his neck, and died. His father concluded his tales of animals that night with the melancholy mawal of gazelles, which he never tired of repeated repeating whenever the moon made uh, rose a few paces higher than the ground, covering the wilderness with its pale silver beams and turning it to a place of magic and mystery. He'd love then to weep over the gazelles, murmuring as if to himself, how beautiful their shape is, their bodies so graceful, so smooth. Mm -hmm. Yes, magic overflows from their eyes. They're the loveliest creatures in the world. They're the spirit of the sandy desert, its vast stretches with its calm and composure and the magic of its mood. We see the impossible in the gazelle. We see freedom. And that's why no creature can ever hope to catch it alive. The thought torments me that I've never in my life held a live gazelle in my hand. Tears would glisten in his eyes, which he'd cover with his veil. And he'd go on through his tears. I just don't understand. Why should this wicked creature, man, chase such an angel to kill it and fill his belly with it? Would man die of hunger if he never killed the gazelle? And why should man be so hungry that he feels he has to spill the blood of this lovely creature? Maybe that's why God punishes us, refuses us to catch it alive. As for the Wadon, if ever it should be mentioned, he'd say in a mysterious tone, the Wadon's different. I fear the Wadon. The Wadon was intelligent. It had grown less elusive over the past few years since peace settled on the Wadis of Masarsu Satvat. And they'd had less to fear from hunters and shepherds' dogs and the rifles of adventurers. No one had killed a Wadon and the rifles of adventurers. No one had killed the Wadon in these parts since the time of his father's death. And the animal, feeling secure, had come down from its fortress in the high mountains, venturing to share the sparse food with the herds of goats in the lower pastures. The vow stopped the son from following his father in hunting the Wadon. His father, after all, had died because he had broken the sacred pledge. Vows are no light matter, and the Wadon knows that. How could he not know it when he's the spirit of the mountains? Spirits are from the spirit of God, and they see everything. They know what man keeps hidden deep in his heart, and that's why they're so utterly, amazingly sure of themselves. The splendid Wadon was butting now at the disheveled, ugly creature, the jealous he-goat. The he-goat was pawing the ground with his faint hooves, making his challenge ready for battle. God, who ever saw a Wadon butting with a he-goat? I'm going to have to stop there. But you can sort of surmise what might happen next. He's surprised they're there in his little herd of goats. 
And he suddenly gets this strange urge, as did his father, to capture Awadon. And all he has with him, of course, is rope. So he swings the rope around and gets it around you know, the Wadon's horns. And as he know from his father, the Wadon sets off you know, like a blaze of fire. And our boy, for some reason, not thinking clearly, gets dragged across the desert and up over the rocks and the hills to the very top. Oh, and is actually hanging by a thread to the same cliff his father broke his neck at. Um, let me just read the last paragraph of that chapter. Where was his courage, his nobility, the fear of committing a shameful act? Where were these things his father had spent his whole life striving to plant in his heart? He'd consider himself alive, he had said, so long as those principles were alive in his son's heart. Only when his son betrayed any of these things would he himself die. And so his father was undying, even in death. No, he wouldn't betray any of these things. If life was so easy to re renounce, why did God give us life at all? Life. The eternal desert, ever sad. The happy leaping goats and the graceful fleeting gazelles. The murmurs of the mother in the cave on winter's nights, that was life. How could he abandon it, loosen his clutch and leave it to plummet into the abyss? There are so many principles in this book and so much exploration of being alone and independent and on one's own. And yet there is, of course, as I mentioned in my introduction, there is the arrival of the enemy. The enemy, um, which had already used, believe it or not, a machine gun given by some Italian uh, that was heading off to the siege of Tripoli, a historical event, and um, killed all the gazelles. And then the gazelles were smart enough to move south, west, further. That's why there were no more here. But we get to a very perilous point with our boy Asu. Anyway, the bleeding of the stone, that does, of course, refer to the bleeding of the father there and also the bleeding of the son later, who does not die, I will tell you that. So the story can't go on for a pace. Uh, it's a, a lovely story about a far off land, a land we know nothing of, most of us anyway, um, and a culture we know nothing at all. I've always been fascinated by Bedouins, and uh, this gave me more fascination. I'd love to go on a camel ride in a caravan. Maybe I would, <laughs> once I think of the heat. Maybe I changed my mind. Uh, but anyway, there it is. So the Bleeding of the Stone by Ibrahim al Khonai, translated by Mary J. Yusi and Christopher Ting Lee. A winning combination of ecological fable, political statement, and lyrical lament for the past. That said by Kirkus Reviews. Let me tell you a little bit about next week's books, if I may. As we start August, I am going to uh, do what I frequently do, is start out with a great book, or a great author, a great American author. Um, uh, and from the, um, uh, the 20th century or even the 19th century. We're going to the 20th century this time, uh, to 1922, actually, a book that was published. The name of the author is no surprise to anyone. Uh, Willa Carper. Willa Carper. Uh, she's such an award-winning American novelist and noted for her portrayals of the frontier and the settlers' life on the American plains. Um, and um, there are some famous novels of hers. Um, of course, My Antonia, you may know. Uh, and uh, that's part of a trio of books written together. 
But I decided to choose one that I didn't know, which is always good, I think. And coincidentally, it is one that was uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1923, the prize in the category novel, which, by the way, was renamed fiction in 1947. A little bit of trivia there. <laughs> the name of the book is One of Ours. One of Ours. And despite the popularity of Maya Antonia, um, this book um, is the one that won the prize. So uh, one of ours tells the story of the life of Claude Wheeler, a native of Nebraska around the turn of the 20th century. The son of a successful Midwestern farmer and an intensely pious mother, this thus guaranteed a comfortable livelihood. Claude Wheeler nonetheless views himself as a victim of his father's success and his own inexplicable melees. One of ours is a portrait of a peculiarly American personality. It's the story of a young man born after the American frontier was banished, yet whose quintessentially American restlessness seeks redemption on a frontier far bloodier and more distant than that which his forefathers had already tamed. And of course, guess what that is? Indeed, World War I. One. one of ours, the 1923 Pulitzer Prize in the category novel, uh, written by a great woman of the American frontier, a great writer, Willa Carthur, uh, published in 1922, one of ours. I hope you'll join me for that. It's, um, I think it's a wonderful book so far. Only halfway through, but I'm enjoying it immensely. Thank you very much for joining me today. For a journey to a far off land, God knows, uh, for a journey to Libya uh, and the very southern part of that big country uh, next door to uh, Algeria. And poor little Tunisia way up there, squeezed between the two of them right there on, on the Mediterranean. <laughs> Um, anyway, I li love exploring foreign cultures, foreign lands, foreign thought processes. So that's why I picked the book. I hope you enjoyed it a bit. I hope your week ahead also is uh, is very good. Certainly that you'll stay healthy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Uh, most, hopefully at least one of those. Um, and healthy being <laughs> that one. If you enjoyed today's program, <clears throat> please uh, press the little icon, thumbs up there. That gives us a little vote of confidence that we're moving in the right direction as far as the kinds of books and the great variety of books uh, that we are selecting for this program. This is the 143rd program that we have recorded uh, in almost three years. You may wish to share it as well uh, with someone, someone who's traveled North Africa, someone who knows the Sahara Desert, 3.5 million square miles amazing uh please do offer a comment if you'd like to share a comment either about the reading of the book or your own experience or a comment about a book you'd like us to read uh, we're always putting together the very next month as we're in the middle of the current month so we're looking now to september also if you would please press that other icon there subscribe it costs nothing except your email address so that we may send you information about upcoming events uh, in our programs department at the Camden Public Library, which of course is exceptionally busy during the summer and the autumn. Uh, it also uh, helps us be a winner. And let me tell you what I mean by that. All of the libraries, the public libraries in the state of Maine, uh, compete on a per capita basis uh, on their membership uh, for being number one, numero uno, <laughs> in which public library has the largest number of subscribers to their YouTube channel. So if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, please do press the subscribe button. We remain uh, for yet another month, number one in the state of Maine, hooray. Uh, we're approaching a year in that position. <laughs> 
even uh, the better, higher numbers than uh, some of the larger libraries in the state of Maine, public libraries. So please do press that if you would subscribe and we'll just send you an email every once in a while with the programming that we have. You might find something quite interesting. Thank you very much for joining on our journey to North Africa today. Have a good week ahead. Hope the weather stays as now we have it and not what we had at the beginning of the summer. And as I always say at the end, if you can be happy, if you have that choice to be happy, then please do so. So much unhappiness in the world at the moment. And be kind. Four letter word, so simple. Thank you very much. Bye.